immediately propels you to a duty-bound destiny in the public eye. Well, I'm better than William, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's that bad. been helping him with the exam? Uh, yeah, an awful lot. He needs a lot of help. From the hospital steps cameo... May we see your son, your Royal Highness? Royal children have always been exposed to prying cameras, whether it's paparazzi or whether it's staff cameramen belonging to, uh, to newspapers. Uh, that's par for the course. To your first day at school... If you're a child in the royal family and you're hoping to grow up and, and go to an ordinary school, you can forget it. Everything is under constant scrutiny. Elizabeth and Margaret and, and other royal children have to live in this gilded cage, which has many wonderful features, but it's also a bit of a prison. As royal commentators dispel the myth of the monarchy... They ended up with the king doing the conga round the state rooms of Buckingham Palace. Experts will break down key archive from crucial moments in royal history. It was a fairy tale created by the Grimm brothers. Anybody entering the royal circles needs to come with their A game. So prepare to discover what actually happens when blue blood runs red. What have you been doing in here all day? This is The Royals Revealed. In this episode, we'll reveal how royal home learning is hardcore. The mantra was to spoil the child is to spoil the adult. You've got a mother who is, if you like, mother to the nation, and her own son feels remote from that, removed from that. And how classrooms can be cruel. He hated his time at Cheam largely because he was very badly bullied. Charles sadly always looked uncomfortable in his own skin. Attempts at adolescent individualism are admonished. Those who are in any way imaginative like uh, he is, quickly find themselves out in a limb. Some royals may decide not to give their children the HRH title because it gives them more freedom. And hints of defying conventions scorned. It absolutely terrified the courtiers because uh, they thought it, she might actually do this. She was seen as a bit of a loose cannon. So as the pressures of accountability to the firm weigh heavy, is it any surprise the royals have rarely passed through their education with flying colours? But I've never seen anything quite like it before. I think I've got quite a large one here. It, it's very, very large indeed. I, I, I... With the Queen now in her 90s, her childhood may seem like a distant memory. But the strength of character she has displayed throughout her reign was forged in her formative years. Thanks to the discipline of no-nonsense nanny, Clara Knight. The mantra was to spoil the child is to spoil the adult. She was quite switched on lady and an influence in those early days of, uh, of Princess Elizabeth. Um, and uh, played an important part in her life because Princess Elizabeth's parents, who were then the Duke and Duchess of York, were busy working uh, in support of George V. What Nanny said, Nanny was obeyed. There was a sort of tradition then among the royals and the English aristocracy to be, it sounds absolutely bizarre now given you know current attitudes, but there was a tradition of being emotionally cold um, with your children. That was seen as a good thing. These orders had been instigated by Elizabeth's grandma, Queen Mary, the matriarchal force of the family. She impressed on Elizabeth the need to understand that she would always be watched. She couldn't do anything where there wasn't a risk of criticism. So there's a famous story where um, she, Queen Mary said to the governors, you must teach that child not to fidget. And what that would have done is she would have like, internalised that messaging from very early on and learned to follow the rules be a good girl and conform. And they, that might be one of the pillars of how she functions, you know, self-discipline, self-control and duty. And she seems to have learned that lesson incredibly well. Famously, she's supposed to have remarkable bladder control. She, um, she can sit through hours of sometimes rather boring events without ever falling asleep or having to get up and go out of the room. Nannies have been hugely important to the royals over the decades because, especially with the case with um, 
older generations, they have helped to bring the royals up. Royals used to be brought up on the nursery floor, and that meant that they didn't really see their parents until the evening. So the nanny isn't only there to educate, but also to feed, to comfort, to reassure, to help build confidence. So they're hugely instrumental figures. Elizabeth and Margaret and, and other royal children, right up probably to the 1960s, had this emotionally, what's a good word for it, detached from their parents' kind of childhood, combined with the huge pressure of, of being royals, of having at some stage to take over royal duties, either as the monarch or as, you know, if you were the second son, as the spare and the other children of, of the monarch, who, who have to live in this gilded cage, which has many wonderful features, but it's also a bit of a prison. Princess Elizabeth sort of took it in her stride with all the with all the nannies and governesses that looked after her. Elizabeth had a French governess, uh, taught her French, and to this day the Queen speaks French. Went goes down extremely well. So, all these people who played a key role in her early days uh, would look down from the heavens and say, "Gosh, we did a good job, didn't we?" Despite the strict shackles. Elizabeth did at least enjoy some pursuits 1930s kids could relate to. But as her uncle looked set to abdicate the throne, it would change her life forever. The Duke of York is next in line for the British throne, and next to him in succession is his eldest daughter, the Princess Elizabeth, shown here with her father and mother. It wasn't inevitable that she was going to become queen by any means because no one knew at the time what was going to happen to Edward VIII. But it was always on the back of people's minds that should Edward VIII not marry or not have children, that Elizabeth was next in line. So as George VI took the throne, it was time to start shaping up for her future. She was allowed, and against all protocol, her father allowed her to look through the red boxes, you know, the, the documents from government that she had to look through and sign, or he had to look through and sign. She was getting more constitutional history lessons than Princess Margaret, which was something that caused discomfort between the two sisters. And so it was always the case that George VI and the Queen Mother had to prepare Elizabeth for the throne. But outside the palace walls, there was much more Elizabeth had to learn. And her next move would be totally unexpected. As Princess Elizabeth reached her late teens, she was considered timid to the point of gaucheness. And now, as the heir to the throne and with the country at war, it was imperative to try and change that. When Princess Elizabeth joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service, she felt that... It was time for her to do something. She had been a brownie, she had been a girl guide, uh, she'd been a sea ranger, she wanted to do something useful. And so, at the age of 18, she duly swapped the pageantry of being a princess for boiler suits and oil-stained fingers. She felt that she should be leading by example, even in those early days. It's easy to be cynical and say, oh, this was just good PR. But there certainly was a PR element, but there was also a genuine feeling. Elizabeth had a genuine sense that she should do this. I think we're getting more clues about the real queen from the ATS stuff. I think she's been more revealing. She's not doing that by being all singing or dancing, but I think she was marinated in this kind of royal duty role and always looking like the little princess and almost being quite motherly to her sister as well um, and being very ladylike. And suddenly it's an almost unisex role where she can use her skills and her brain in work that was known as man's work in those days. And she was clearly very good at it. She still loves to show off that she can do all of that kind of thing. So I think she probably knew this was going to be her only chance to revel in a life like that, because after that it was going to be all about crowns and elegance and being incredibly ladylike. There was also the chance to experience the freedom of having her own set of wheels. She suddenly was out in the wider world. She wasn't living any longer in the palace, surrounded by servants. I mean, she certainly went back to that, but it would have given her a glimpse of the wider world and it would have given her practical skills. Though she was careering around in trucks in her teens, 
the Queen has never had to take a driving test. Queens don't take tests, certainly not in those days. Uh, she learned to drive on the private estate. Uh, she doesn't drive on public roads at all. So there was no need to take a test. She's a good driver even today. I've driven with her, uh, never worried at all. But if there was a trace of the regimented lifestyle being eased, that all evaporated a few years later with her father's death, as the premature end of one reign meant the sooner than expected start of hers. The biggest test for um, Elizabeth certainly came when her father died. But, and I think also Elizabeth, she did have a strong sense of the history of the royal family. And she knew that her situation as a very young woman um, becoming uh, the monarch of what was still then a pretty big empire paralleled uh, or was paralleled by her ancestor, Queen Victoria, who became queen at a very young age and was remarkable in very quickly getting a grip on what was seen as, you know, in Victorian times, an even more difficult task for a young woman. The shock of her father's death was trauma enough. Then Elizabeth had to step into becoming queen at the age of only 25. Now, when somebody experiences the traumatic loss of a parent, sometimes their way of dealing with it is to throw themselves into work. And I wonder whether this is something that she did. She just focused on her duty. The narrowness of, of her education was the perfect preparation for being the monarch because she's very single-minded. She hasn't been distracted by all sorts of other intellectual possibilities. And so, and so that focus has enabled her to hardly put her foot wrong for decades while she does this one job that she's really, really good at. But no matter how well she took to becoming the monarch, her sense of duty had a knock-on effect for her own offspring. Charles was a lonely child, primarily because the Queen had to go off and do the job for which she was, uh, which she was anointed to, uh, and therefore had to leave the children around. Prince Charles was only three when his mother became queen and knew no different. So from that point onwards, his destiny, his path was marked out before him, even when he was just a toddler. You've got a mother who is, if you like, mother to the nation, and her own son feels remote from that, removed from that. And I wonder whether, from his point of view, that psychological and emotional bonding and closeness didn't happen in a way that made him feel secure with her. By the time he was eight, the Queen and Prince Philip decided Charles needed the company of children in a classroom. Someone said he, he thinks too much for, for someone so young. And throughout his life, but especially when he was a child, it's very clear that he, he was, I wouldn't say oversensitive, but certainly uh, more sensitive than would work to his advantage. So Charles became the first heir to be educated outside the palace. He hated his time at Cheam largely because he was very badly bullied. I think he didn't particularly enjoy being away from home and was terribly homesick. Uh, the students there seemed to perceive that if they befriended Prince Charles, they would be accused of sucking up. Even Sports Day, supposedly one of the highlights of the term, brought the embarrassment of having to introduce his parents to his classmates. And his exacting father wouldn't have been impressed by his aptitude for competition. Philip's answer? Get tougher. He's making the decisions about what happens to, to the children and where they're educated. And he wants his son to go to Gordonston, where he feels his sensitive child needs to be toughened up. Although Gordonston suited a character like the Duke of Edinburgh down to the ground, very self-possessed, um, more academic, with great sporting prowess, it was absolutely the wrong environment for a boy as sensitive as Prince Charles was. He still hasn't fully forgiven his father, even now, all these years later, for those early experiences. Having made it through his hardships in the Scottish Highlands, ending up as head boy with five O-levels and two A-levels, 
Charles made his way to Cambridge. Prince Charles famously was admitted to Cambridge with grades at his A-levels that no other human in the world could possibly use to get into Cambridge. Um, so, in a way, that epitomises the difficulty of being a royal, that you don't have to try. I mean, you, you can be very average intellectually or not bother at all at school because the end result will always be the same. You're going to be in the royal family, you're going to be opening hospitals, shaking hands, and in a way, that's both the blessing and the curse of being in the royal family. Prince Charles, the future King of England, becomes a college freshman. Lord Butler, Master of Trinity, greets the Prince, who will major in archaeology and anthropology. The heir to the throne looks like his mother and walks like his father. I think you have to remember, for Charles, there wasn't a comfort zone. So although we're seeing a guy here that is well out of his comfort zone, that comfort zone never existed. Charles sadly always looked uncomfortable in his own skin. Charles's grandfather and great-grandfather were both students here. Well-wishers shouted, good luck, and the prince replied, I'll need it. And I love the way that he kind of cracked open a royal gesture that is used a lot in emergencies here, which I call the pointless point. So when in doubt, they point at things, but it makes them look engaged, but without actually speaking. And you can see him, apropos of nothing, just pointing here. So he was clearly feeling uncomfortable. I talked to someone who was at Cambridge at the same time who said that Charles was always on the edge of things. I mean, he did join in formally, but uh, it was always difficult for him, impossible, in fact, to be treated at just as one of the other, one of the other students. Do you know, I actually saw him there. Um, we had a, a school day outing at Trinity, and imagine a load of giggly schoolgirls. And he walked across the quadrangle behind us. Well, can you imagine? He was always easily embarrassed. His cheeks went absolutely crimson. Undoubtedly, his most striking contribution to student life was as a member of the college's drama group. And here I am, showing just how adaptable the sports commentator can be. All alone on the, the, in a deep sea fishing boat with just my rod and line, the great unknown, a few helicopters and, and uh, ASDIC, but yes, I do believe I got a bite. I, I think he threw himself into theatre because that is what was the one aspect of schooling life that he had enjoyed and that he was actually quite good at. His versatility encompassed enthusiastic sports reporter. Take up the this is most exciting, most exciting, ladies and gentlemen. I've never seen anything quite like it before. I think I've got quite a large one here. It, it's very, very large indeed. I, I, I... An eccentric guy besieged by hostile bagpipes. And he also enjoyed, when acting, playing the fool. He enjoyed a bit of comedy. He's actually quite a funny man, and he enjoys a good laugh. His showstopper was this flustered forecaster. There is a manic depression over Ireland with associated troughs of hay presto. An obsession under Sweden would may, may develop or be relieved by a warm front. Behind that will come a cold back. Whatever comes next. <laughs> um, doesn't happen in the BBC, does it? Um, when he does dry, he just stands there. Temperatures will be slightly reduced and bargains may be had in all departments. Let's see how we need, how we need a dress rehearsal. And, um, his cheeks go absolutely livid, and we can see them getting redder and redder and redder, so we know he's dying inside. Oh, yes, yes. Um. But I suppose, you know, he'd been pushed at Gordonston, he'd been pushed all his life. He could probably hear the Duke of Edinburgh yelling at him, you should have never have done this anyway, but now you're up there, you've got to finish it. Fortunately, he remembered his studies better than his lines and wound up with a 2-2. Oh, yes, I know. Legend has it the bodyguard who was present at all the lectures got a 2-1.
He's one of these people, and there are a lot out there, who learn a lot more out of school than you learn in school. He's a very well-read person. He's a very intelligent person. And he'll put himself uh, to any topic of conversation. You'll never stump him when it comes to conversing. You can come up with some esoteric subject and he'll be able to talk about it. So he's a very well-read and learned person and, and, and an interesting person as well. But if you compare today to what he was like at school, two completely different people. When Charles became a father to William in 1982 and Harry in 1984, outward appearances may have portrayed one of harmony. His parents' main concern is to give their new baby as normal an upbringing as possible. Prince Charles is even said to have changed Prince William's nappy. But inside the family, there were several conflicts brewing. So although the new prince will share Prince William's nanny, Barbara Barnes, who's always there when mummy and daddy aren't, his parents will try and be with him as much as they can. Diana had a strained relationship with Barbara Barnes, who was William and Harry's first nanny. I think she got quite jealous of Barbara because she had grown so close to the princes. And being a maternal figure and somebody who wanted to be hands-on, I think Diana didn't want to be pushed out. Diana didn't want William and Harry to be brought up on the nursery floor. She loved to look after people, so she was a great nurturer. You've got to remember that before Diana married, she was an assistant at Little England Kindergarten. She had an affinity with children, she adored children. If she, she could have had an army of children if she if, if she tried hard enough. We have all seen those pictures with her outstretched arms, hugging William and Harry. She ripped up that royal handbook. Why, she's a product of different times. You know, perhaps a lot more psychologically aware about what her needs were. She knew what she wanted in her life. She wanted to be hugged, she wanted to be loved. Royal staff witnessed this contrast to previous generations firsthand. When I was working at the palace, William and Harry were just like normal children. They knew that their mother was special, they knew that their father was special, their grandmother was the queen, but it didn't go to them. They just behaved like normal children. Um, William was slightly more reticent than Harry. Harry has always been a bit, bit gung-ho. But they were normal kids. They enjoyed doing what normal kids do. And also, famously, she insisted to the horror of some of the uh, courtiers, she insisted on taking them to McDonald's. Diana gave them the high street. She gave them the movie house, the hamburger joint, the departmental store, the supermarket. Diana may have been fighting a losing battle to try and give her kids a normal upbringing. Why? Because they are privileged, they are royal, they're already in, if you like, that gilded fishbowl. That's where they are. But I think her attempts to do so may have given them some more balance. You know, showing regular people, taking them to charities, you know, seeing real poverty may have also been messages that they internalise so that they have a much more balanced outlook rather than just one world view, which was narrow and privileged and remote. So, how would William and Harry go on to fare when they'd had to fend for themselves in the big wide world and media spotlight glare?
In comparison to previous royal generations, Prince William and Prince Harry's childhood seem to have come with perhaps a bit more freedom than their predecessors. But even playtime was never really normal. But this year, at midday in the old fire station yard of Sandringham House, the Queen had laid on a treat for the press. A treat, too, for the grandchildren, who were allowed to play on the ancient appliance. There's a kind of an, an intentional gesture here that, no, this is just a photo opportunity. We do it to keep the press off our backs, and those kids will probably just stand there doing the royal thing, and the Queen will stand there next to them with approval signals, and all will be well. But what they hadn't reckoned on was um, Harry and William. I, I, it is absolutely hilarious. Diana's boys come flying out. Those boys have no heed of the camera whatsoever, and that's quite remarkable. They just see the fire engine, and it's major clamber time. And you can see Diana just standing there, not intervening, because clearly she wanted normal children, normal, boisterous children. But the Queen is almost quietly imploding. You do not see the Queen using body language very much. It's as rare as hen's teeth. But there's a huge display here. There's a, she emerges anyway with an unusual hand gesture for her, uh, meshed fingers in the clasp. And I think that's because she's holding on to her temper for dear life. She also, when she comes out, you can see her licking her lips, which is a sign that the adrenaline is beginning to build up, that all is perhaps not well in the firm at that point. And then you can see her face when she's watching them clambering around. And again, um, you can, she's biting her tongue to not tell those children off. And it's very much old fashioned royal parenting as opposed to Diana's hands off their young, let them have a good time. So I think Philip and Elizabeth, when they saw Diana um, doing this very modern version of parenting, not wanting to go away on official trips too often to be away from the children, I think they felt that Diana was taking it too far. And that's where we reached the point where um, duty and, and, and private life come into conflict. I think the Queen, Charles, and Prince Philip felt that, that Diana was sacrificing duty to some extent to uh, this notion that she had that she should be an ordinary mother. But did Charles's worries have an even more damaging effect on the family dynamic? Someone said to me, Charles was jealous of all the attention that William and Harry got from Diana, um, which takes us into the whole psychology of, of perhaps Charles needing someone to mother him. Ever since Prince Charles became the first heir to be schooled outside the palace, any subsequent royal foray into education has grabbed the media's attention. Royal children have always been exposed to prying cameras, whether it's paparazzi or whether it's staff cameramen belonging to, uh, to newspapers. Uh, that's par for the course. Royals kind of have to make a fuss of their children's first day at school because we demand to see the pictures. <laughs> For William and Harry, this fascination began at nursery. Prince William is an old hand. He went to this school for a year. The Princess of Wales made sure young Harry was centre stage for the well-practised wave. I'm not sure the royal children particularly enjoy it, but it's just a royal rite of passage. Two hours later, the young prince left for home. He'd made a pair of binoculars and showed a joyous determination to beat the press at their own game. The paps were a constant for every new first day that followed. William and Harry started their schooling life at Weatherby Prep before moving on to Ludgrove and then going to Eton. There was an idea that Charles and Diana wanted a degree of localism towards their son's education because Charles had had such a miserable time being sent away to board at Gordonston. And I don't think Diana wanted the children to be too far away either. Apparently, to tease these old Etonian advisers, she said, oh, I, I really think we should look at um, sending William and Harry to um, uh, Holland Park Comprehensive. It's a big state school just around the corner, around the back of, of Kensington Palace. And of course, she didn't mean this, you know, but, but it absolutely terrified the courtiers because uh, they thought it, she might actually do this. She was seen as a bit of a loose cannon. Rural favorite Eton, played host to both boys' secondary education. If you're a child in the royal family and you're hoping to grow up and, and go to an ordinary school, you can forget it, because 
uh, like nannies and governesses, public school is just seen as an essential part of growing up as a royal. They were probably teased a bit when they went to school because uh, although they went to school as William Wales and Henry Wales or Harry Wales, uh, people knew that they were both princes and Prince Charles was one day going to be king. They were expected to deliver the grades, yet Harry seemed to play the fool. He experienced his parents' divorce, which would have had its own emotional trauma. His mother tragically and violently dies. That's another emotional trauma. At 17, he's called a pothead, so he's already rebelling, a lot like lots of different young people do. It's a developmental stage, saying, I don't want to follow my parents, I want to follow my peers. Harry left Eton with two A-levels, a B in art and D in geography. William, on the other hand, took his education further. So far, in fact, it was in another country. To the delight of fellow St Andrews alumni, like Kate Middleton's Hall's neighbour, Helen McArdle. Those of us who were residents in St Salvatore's Hall um, were taken into the common room and we were told at that meeting that, you know, in no uncertain terms, we couldn't speak to the press about him. But he didn't turn up alone. Prince William did have two security guards or, or bodyguards who were with him and they stayed in the Hall of Residence. And actually, the, his two bodyguards were so sort of unassuming that for a long time, a lot of us just thought they were mature students. We didn't actually realise they were his bodyguards. As he dynamically strode to his local newsagent for student essentials, such as a notepad, <laughs> William hoped he'd blend into the undergrad crowd but that was unlikely. You have, you know, lecture theatres absolutely packed out, people sort of craning their neck to try and get a look at Prince William. He even experimented with nicknames to aid unlikely anonymity. Some people used to refer to Prince William as Steve as a nickname, and I think we used to refer to Prince William sometimes as P. Willie. But he couldn't hide behind an alias after celebrating the end of first year. Prince William had been coming back with some of his friends and he had stumbled and fallen into the bushes outside the Hall of Residence and his bodyguards basically had to go in and retrieve him and, and, and pull him out and guess, take him off to bed. But the bodyguards' rescue mission didn't end there. Some of the people whose bedrooms overlooked the front of the halls and overlooked these bushes had been you know, taking photos outside of, of the window and apparently the bodyguards came round to confiscate the film from their phones. William had also been the centre of Hall's matchmaking gossip. So definitely in first year, everyone did notice that Kate and William spent an awful lot of time together. You would see him standing outside her room, maybe in the doorway, talking to her. You would see both of them coming and going from lectures together. You knew there, there was definitely a close friendship there. By the time of their graduation, Kate and William were very much an item, as all the family turned out in support. William Wales. This was a proud day for the family and an occasion with its own quirky traditions, like being patted on the head with a leather pouch containing a fragment of the trousers of a 16th century preacher. Peculiar, you said it. The perfect curtain raiser then to a royal life. Meanwhile, it was no surprise that Harry had ditched education to pursue a life in the army. Even as a little boy, he'd dress up in his um, uh, commando ca camouflage gear, and if you were waiting in the sitting room at Kensington Palace, you might see a little uh, toy rifle come round the, the door first, followed by Prince Harry. He was, uh, in a way, always wanted to be a career soldier. For the first time in his life, he realised he was really good at something. Much had been made of his academic record by himself, actually. He used to laugh that, and joke that he wasn't academic and couldn't get good marks in anything. Harry had gained a place at Sandhurst, despite having not been to university and even more remarkably, was eventually selected for the elite Apache co-pilot gunner course which put him on a collision course with William, now himself a qualified pilot with the RAF. 
The brothers had always enjoyed a healthy rivalry throughout their lives, from impromptu sprints to cheeky fouls on the football pitch. Both are quite stubborn. Both are extremely competitive. And the military brings out a spirit of competition and I think there may have been resentment from, on William's behalf that Harry got to serve on the front line and he didn't. Now they had to contend with living and working together. Zam's never been my favourite and I always knew that I was going to find it harder than most people, um, but I'm through that now and uh, finally got hands on to, uh, to a job that I absolutely adore. It is still hard work, but, um, but I'm better than William, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's that You've been helping him with the exams? Uh, yeah, an awful lot. He needs a lot of help. It's, uh, yeah, it's the RF way, so you have to help the army out quite a lot. Banter is always a dangerous game to play. Uh, when you don't use a lot of eye connect and you're not completely tuned in to the other person, and the other person, particularly if they begin to change, if they begin to grow up, if they begin to want to be seen in a slightly more dignified way at times, and you've still got this chipping away banter, it can turn into conflict very easily. And so you got off you the ground yet? Sorry? You got off the ground I yet? I just got off the ground, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks and, for asking. Sorry, just, sorry. And, and, okay. What you've also got here in this plot twist of a dynamic is one is always in the one-up position because he's heir to the throne. So you've got the other brother who may feel that he often has to prove himself. This is quite a special moment for you, isn't it? I mean, this is possibly the last time you've, you've been living together. First and last time we'll be living together. Yeah. It's, it's, been, it's been a fairly emotional experience. Yeah. How much inter-service rivalry is there between you two? None at all. No, not at all, really. I mean, everyone, I'm everyone knows the army. army's I'm better than the I'm a cavalry boy anyway, so it's, uh, it's fine. Wouldn't There's good bands so. between army pilots and the and RF pilots, obviously, as well. And the naval pilots just, you know, in the background, they didn't do anything, so it's fine. In terms of body language, there are a few flashing warning lights here, because banter's great but it can become not great if you go out of kilter. Well, bear in mind, I cook him and feed him basically every day. I think he's, uh, he's done rather well. I told you the other week that he did all the washing up. He does do a bit of the washing up, then he leaves most of it in the sink and then it comes back in the morning and I have to wash it up. <laughs> oh, the lies. Yeah, <laughs> and when you watch people who are very, very good at banter and continue to be good at it, when they're um, joking about the other person, and the joking can be quite vicious, you know, I mean, William, very humiliating with Harry, keeps bantering him back to being a naughty boy that won't do the washing up, you know, oh, he snores, all these kind of things. And that, if you're going to do that, you can maybe get away with it, but your body language needs to be in tune. You need to be watching one another all the time and checking that that's not hurting, that you're not getting annoyed with that and that you're in the right circumstances. And it's, it's somebody's birthday on, on Sunday. Um, are you a bit nervous? Any, any presents you want um, your brother to get for you? Basically, he's probably only literally just realised that you said that Thanks now and, uh, <laughs> and hasn't got me a present, but uh, I wouldn't expect anything else anyway. It's, uh, I'll be lucky to get a card. It's not obvious that he's growing old, is it? With a brotherly bond potentially wavering, further differences would continue to emerge between them as they entered fatherhood. births have always delighted the nation and sparked a media frenzy. Ahead of him, all the strangeness and the razzmatazz of being the son of the future king. Wonderful, this news about Princess Margaret having a baby. I think it's gorgeous. We've even placed bets on what they'll be called. Have you any choice of a name? Not really, I hadn't thought about it. Perhaps Hugh, a Welsh name. A Welsh name, you think? Yes, I think so. Uh, I, I actually think they should have called him Henry. <laughs> well, I like the idea of Henry the Ninth. Henry the Ninth! <laughs> <laughs> With Prince William, a father of three, and Harry welcoming Archie into the world, scrutiny surrounds how the new generation will be raised. And the Cambridges have gone down a traditional route. Sometimes their nanny, Maria, wears her Norland nanny uniform because when in public, everyone needs to be dressed appropriately. So what makes a Norland nanny a cut above the rest? So Norland College has been around for 128 years. It started initially as a training institute to um, train young people in uh, working with young children. 
Norlin has worked with many different families, including royalty, all around the world. And we do um, work hard to ensure that, you know, whoever our graduates go on to work with, that it remains confidential. They may blend in, but do they look familiar? The urban myth is that actually Mary Poppins was role modelled on the nursery nurses that Norland uh, generated. Uh, in fact, the uniform or the costume that uh, Mary Poppins wore was um, very closely linked to the uniform that the nursery nurses first started to wear in those days. And this, this idea of having a uniform, if you like, for your role was one of the key ways that our founder tried to distinguish the nursery nurse role or the nanny role from other staff in the household. Their discretion isn't the only secret service element. We have a black belt type. Our by all accounts, they're just like normal parents, whatever that means. They're very affectionate. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge really appear to have stepped up to the plate. The institution has learnt that it's very important if members of the royal family have children, they should be allowed to have that quality time in the early years of the child's upbringing to be there for them, to be there in the morning, to be there at bedtime, to be there to pick them up from school. Also, if you look beyond Prince William, and I appreciate that some time away, but you see Prince George and Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis lined up. So that's the next generation of monarchy. We don't know what the monarchy is going to look like by then, and it could be even more modern than it is now. 